Welcome to The Ross Project, a conversation about life, entrepreneurship, personal development, family, tech, and marketing. My name is Ivan Tomokov, and I'm your host. On this podcast, you will gather 100% real, raw, and unfiltered, life-changing advice to level up in every aspect of your life and business and help you reach your goals and dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm joined by Kenya Brooks-Jones, who is the president of and CIO of Jones Software Corp, launched in 2015. Kenya leverages her expertise in education, software technology, IBM, enterprise design thinking certification, Cisco certification, AT&T data credentials, medical technology, AstraZeneca pharmaceutical sales and television media. Kenya's executive leadership experience consists of building partnerships among key stakeholders in education, business, and government, including the UK, Belgium, South Africa, and Brazil. Kenya's business acumen also includes marketing, advertising, and business development. Kenya has demonstrated the ability to leverage resources to effectively position Jones Software Corporation as a sustainable leader in ed tech community. Kenya, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan, for having me. Absolutely. So I want to start, first of all, I'm, I'm very, very ecstatic to have you on the show. And, and one of the reasons is because, and I want to kind of kick things off with that. And, you know, in your, in your bio, you mentioned that uh, you are a former classically trained dancer that performed at the Bolshoi Theater in Russia. All right. For anyone that's like, you know, art challenge, you know, <laughs> cultural arts challenge, the Bolshoi Theater is probably one of the most prominent theaters in the world to this yeah. day. Regardless of what your take is on, I think they used to call it Mother Russia, is what mm -hmm. people used to call it, right? Let's talk about the Bolshoi Theater. How, let's start off the conversation. Tell us in a few minutes, like, how did that happen? Like, how did you end up there? Well, an amazing experience. I started uh, training ballet on my own just because um, a little latchkey, but both my parents were... Uh, armed force servants and public servants, police officers, detectives. So there was a lot of time on my hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I started taking ballet classes. And my at the time, my middle school didn't have like a talent show anywhere for me to fulfill my talents. I wasn't the prettiest girl in the world. So pageants wasn't a strong suit, but I dibbled and dabbled. And I continued to just work on the craft. So I was offered an audition to one of the top performing art schools in the South in Atlanta. Uh, kind of, if you remember Fame, uh, mm -hmm. the movie, it was, it was a school yeah. based on just something exactly like that in the Atlanta area. And I got in. I got in probably... Uh, Janet Jackson, she was my hero. So yeah. uh, continued to train and, and work hard. And we uh, were awarded uh, the opportunity to follow the Olympic Committee back in the 80s when Atlanta was sorting for the Olympics for 96. And so we were some of the elite of talent that followed the Olympic Committee mm -hmm. around the world. And Russia was one of the places that they decided to do a student exchange. Right. Uh, it was still Soviet then, so it was uh, a tour of Moscow, uh, Leningrad, which is St. Petersburg, and then mm -hmm. we did a stint in Kiev. So it was a travel experience, uh, fully funded by American Express and Coca-Cola. So we were known as Coca-Cola Kids. And we were there for many openings, uh, whether it was the Kremlin or the first Pizza Hut or McDonald's. And mm -hmm. the brochure was our culminating um, performance night when we started and the goal was to start bending the relationships between the two countries and it was yeah. a successful trip but it it changed me personally because we saw a lot that was different from how we were reared in the states and the sure. exposure that we had so it it really humbled me and and i am 48 years old now that trip happened mm -hmm. in 1989 uh, to 1990 and this is the Christmas card oh wow we were given um, during that time so if you notice here it's still some Russian handwriting but I was Kenya I McCarty probably read that actually uh, yeah it's, and this it's, is it's my like... this is my student pendant uh, visa from 
okay. um, that experience. So I, I travel this with me, even though I still travel abroad and many other places and I do many of the leadership experiences. Um, my goal now is that kids, you have to get exposed. And so this is where yep. my real exposure started uh, with people that didn't look like me or didn't have the same cultures or experiences. Mm -hmm. But I gained so many pen pals and relationships um, out of that student exchange that this is how I feel like it's a full circle moment. <laughs> yeah. And you and I are even yeah. sitting here today, really. Yeah, um, it's not going to cry, not going to cry, not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, it, it's sentimental. It, it really is, you know, and as you were talking about this, I mean, there's so much I can really say to that because you were speaking to, to the cultural differentiation, you right. know, I think, and, and personally, you know, as I'm an Eastern European, grew up in Bulgaria, my yeah. family immigrated here, risked and sacrificed a lot for my goals and dreams. I mean, a lot. I a mean, lot. A, Absolutely. Far, far more than what most Americans are willing to do. And, exactly. and, when you were talking about the cultural differences, I think, you know, and mind you, that was, that was um, uh, during the time of communism, too, when correct. you were there. So and I was most, there, correct. And yes. you were there. And so what <laughs> most people can't fathom, because I'm an 80s kid. I mean, love Michael Jackson, you know. Duran Duran. Duran Duran, <laughs> Janet Jackson. I mean, I mean no, yeah. <laughs> that was the 80s, man. Yeah, like, that I was remember, the 80s. <laughs> I remember watching that back home when I was like, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And like, that was actually when I actually started dreaming about, I remember that vividly. It's like, yes. what would my life be, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now? Now I'm 40 years old and I found myself in the United States of America. I mean, the one of the best things that have ever happened to me. But, you know, we talked about this before we had recorded. If it wasn't for my father who risked, you know, being away Everything. from his family for three years, you know, to, to know that, you know what, I am building a better life with more Absolutely. opportunities because in the United States of America, you can be anything you want to be. Absolutely. You just have to set your mind to it. But guess what? When back in 1988, 1989, if you lived in Russia or Eastern Europe, you didn't have that chance. You no, just didn't. Choice, exactly. There were no choices. There were no yeah. choices. And so it's amazing that you got to experience that. And you know what? That is such a priceless memory. You should just show it. As you were kind of opening it up, I'm like, I, I see the serial like there. I can probably re read it because nowadays I'm like terrible at speaking Bulgarian, especially yeah. <laughs> with, with my parents. So like I switched to English because I'm 26 years now, you know, U.S. citizen in the United States, but it wasn't always that way. And exactly. you get to a point where your brain like permanently just turns on your second language because it's so tired of constantly translating. And that was my dilemma in high school. You know, Absolutely. Like, well, yeah, and you were young, too. It was a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, I was yeah. 13, 14 years old, you know, when we yeah. first immigrated here. And so that's an amazing experience. That's why I wanted you to talk about it, because, you know, being in the Bolshoi Theater and, and, and ballet, right? Ballet. So being yes. a part of that, too. I mean, Russian ballet is unprecedented, and even beautiful. to this day. To this day, yeah. I mean, we got Baryshnikov out mm -hmm. of it, but it's so much more than that. that yeah. You know, people think about, I mean, that's the first person they think about when they think about the Russian ballet, but it's yeah. so much more than that. And so much beautiful, the tones and the strengths and the lengths. And I mean, yeah. to this day, I'm forever changed just from the training um, that we received because I wasn't yep. as crisp. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, as you were actually talking about the Bolshoi Theater and why this brings so many memories to me is because uh, back in Bulgaria, my father was a musician. And so he played in the classical music orchestra and he played trombone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of the extension of that story is when, when he immigrated to the U.S. in 1990, he actually tried out for the St. Louis Symphony. So we live in oh, St. Wow. Louis, Missouri, and that's one of the most prominent in the country. I mean, you it go is. through a very rigorous process of elimination. And so... Yes. You know, he was wanting to continue his music musical career, which, by the way, took him from like 15,000 people that tried down to like 50. Yeah. Before he got cut. So it was a very rigorous process of elimination. But back in the day when I was young, and they toured a lot of Eastern Europe, which was actually kind of cool because they go to Italy or to France <clears throat> or to right. Germany. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he would come home late at night. I remember when he went to Italy, he brought me this gondola lamp yeah it was like, 
it was a light lamp and it was amazing. The crack, I still remember it to this day. It was yeah. a light lamp, like, uh, like about this big, but I used to sit in, in, in a classical music opera as he played. Cause you know, remembering ballet, the, the, um, uh, the orchestra was underneath. That's how Correct. they had it set up. It and then yeah. ballet was across <laughs> the top. And like, yeah. I hated it when I was young. I hated it yeah. because I mean, you know, you're, you're four, five, six, seven, eight years old. Like, that's the last thing you want to be doing is listening to classical music. Yeah, when, I mean, you're young. It's, yeah. It, exactly. You're, you're young. Kids, right? yeah, you're young. And so that's why I wanted to touch upon that to kick things off on this episode because Absolutely. there's just so many fond memories of that, you know, and, and the, the travel, which uh, there were some weeks where I didn't get to see my father a lot because – you know, he traveled so much, you know, and um, it was actually Rusa was the town that, you know, I was born in, which is north, up north by the Danube River in Bulgaria, which borderlines with the Romania. And yes, so they traveled right. a lot to Romania, you know, which back in the day, you had to have visas. Now with the European Union, you just cross well, over. Yeah, basically. It was, it was visa for every, yeah. <laughs> it was visa for everything. And yeah, so it was. That's such an amazing experience. You know, most people don't get to experience anything like that, let alone leave the country. Because let's face it, I hate to sound degrading, but most, most Americans have not even left their city. Exactly. And, you know, that, and I always often tell anyone that trip. I mean, I've been to many places. You know, my mm -hmm. mom grew up in Spain and was raised in London. So I've had posh travel experiences. I've had, you know, in the trenches in South Africa or Swaziland. I've, yeah. I've, I give myself to humanitarian to wherever I can, yeah. uh, wherever I'm needed or called or invited. Um, but Russia was the thing that I think shaped me into my today. It, it changed me forever. Um, yeah. I, I've never played the victim a, a ne another day since we landed back um, and Atlanta Hartsfield airport, everything, yeah. uh, being a better kid to being kind to my great grandparents from the, the university I chose to attend because yeah. everything yeah. changed that, that experience forever. Uh, and I carry it with me to this day. Like just, you know, you talk about the memory of your childhood, um, good memories, but uh, yeah. it's again, the reason why, I'm in this business. The reason why I sure. have always pushed and anyone around me knows I will push you really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. And, and I want to segue into that. But one thing yeah. I wanted to mention before moving on from the Bolshoi theater in Russia is that for, for anyone listening, if you're a history buff is uh, anyone would appreciate the Russian czars, the history yeah. behind the Russian czars. I mean, such a powerful and rich history. I Absolutely. mean, it goes back to, you know, medieval times of, and that's why you hear it to this day that people talk about, like, is Russia really as powerful as it claims to be or once was? Or do they really have as much gold as they, because the, the era of the tar, czars, right? Yeah, like back they, in the day, they, they had so they much do. gold, <laughs> yeah. so much wealth that yes. uh, some people, you know, uh, historians are led to believe that that gold is probably buried somewhere for like, you know, dark times that hypothetically, if there is a third world war, you know, that like Russia will literally play that card, you know? Well, and again, if you've ever been to a monastery there, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's believable, right? It is believable because it's all gold. <laughs> yeah, it's all gold. Yeah, like, I, know, I went to two or three monasteries and I'm like, it's pretty <laughs> shiny in here. <laughs> it really is pretty shiny. And, th and people yeah. think it's fake, but it's actual gold. It's actual gold. Exactly. It's yeah, real. It's actual gold. Don't touch. And, come light your yep. candle, pray. And, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's kind of shift a little bit too, because I want to talk a little bit about, you know, John Software Corporation and, uh, you know, so let, let's start with your story. Like, how did this all come about? So, I mean, you started this, you know, five years ago. Yes. Right? So, like, so let's uh, talk about that. My amazing husband, uh, we were both in our prospective career. So he spent almost 15 plus years on mm -hmm. Wall Street. And at the time I was in big pharma doing a really good job. <laughs> 
And uh, his goal was to make inroads. He was uh, in a Merrill Lynch office in Northwest Indiana, which uh, if you ever heard of Gary, Indiana, Michael Jackson's hometown. Yeah. He was starting to make inroads into the community and he just gravitated toward educators. And with that, he started mentor programs uh, through Merrill Lynch's help. And he would bring a lot of us professionals into the school district personally to start mentoring. Mm -hmm. But before we could get past to the mentoring days, we had to deal with behavior and, you know, home environments and just kids yeah. were not gravitating toward education. And we started scratch paper um, fluency. And he took that scratch paper and said, you know, at the kitchen sink, I always say the Steve Wozniak version. And he just built um, a, a small platform, maybe not DOS, but I always say it's DOS. It, it's, it was more, yeah. you know, fluent than that. But it worked. I mean, and I always say it was horrible, yeah. but the engagement work, the efficacy stores, you know, teachers started asking us, what were we doing in these mentor days? And, you know, our goal was to go in, I was going to teach ballet and etiquette and I had all these <laughs> other ideas. But what we learned was math was, they were so deficient that we started just focusing on that. And once we saw that we had something, uh, he started selling it nominally. I was almost giving it away, but just for the effort of, you know, these school districts yeah. in Northwest yeah. Indiana, uh, parts of, uh, we call it South Suburban Illinois here where we live. Mm -hmm. But it was working and we learned that it was more the underserved, underrepresented students. Um, they weren't getting the funding like some of the higher um, education schools. And we one day said, you know what, we've got to turn this into a business. We, we have something. We kind of didn't know what we had, but yeah. we knew that uh, according to those test scores, we partnered with Northwest Indiana University and did our first, uh, my, I call clinical because that's my background, but it was a, mm -hmm. our first stu efficacy study and the scores were jumping up from uh, we had third grade students getting at level, above level, sixth grade students, eighth grade students. And we found this incubator here in Chicago. Our former mayor said, well, you need to get over to 1871. We thought, what, the Chicago fire? What do you mean, yeah. 1871? <laughs> yeah. And uh, we did. We, we found 1871 and found that they had a big partnership with Microsoft. And uh, we could get over there and kind of... Uh, hone in on our craft and see if we really had something in development. And our first version flopped. Yeah. Dead. I mean, school districts went to sign on and it just didn't work. I mean, and so you yeah. talk about F-bombs. I mean, to hear, you know, graduated PhD superintendents call you names. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's suddenly you find out like what the real picture looks like. But you know what? That what's really interesting about what you said that I really want to note it is the flop portion because yes. from an entrepreneurship standpoint, what most people don't understand is just that the first go to market product or service will usually flop. Not once, yeah. twice, or maybe even three times or more times before you get it right. Exactly. And so in that flop, we you know, we spend our own money, we bootstrap, we don't have mm -hmm. funding. This is like, you know, Wall Street and Big Pharma coming together with 401k money and, <laughs> and, and believing in what we're doing, right? Sure. And so we learned this term in um, technology called pivot. Yeah. And it was like, no, we had to double step, triple step pivot, because we yep. still had clients, because we had built an online learning platform, but we also, to the need, because we use, you know, deal with underserved kids, we'd also built an outside class curriculum. So we have partners like Apple and Google and Microsoft and yep. ComEd here, which is our Exelon. So our field trips were remarkable. I mean, we have coding kids, we have internships going, but the platform had flopped. So we had to pivot yeah. quickly so we could meet the other side. And it was only a little bit of money to do it. So we're like, you know, who do we cut? Who gets cut? Right. What do we cash in? You know, what, you know, what blood do we go and, and donate? Like it was, it was, a, <laughs> you know, what, 
we sold SUVs. <laughs> That's I mean, what you do. It, it was just a all or nothing uh, to the point where we were telling our kids, well, here are where the life insurance policies are. If, if we take a leap, um, you know, we're, yeah. we, won't, we won't be here anymore, but we love you. And yeah. I told him one night, I said, it'll be our luck. God won't let us die. We'll be in wheelchairs and the kids will be able to reap the benefits of everything we've done. So, but that's just it. Yeah. That's just it. Is this that is as you were talking about this, and again, I want to highlight this, is that how much are you willing to risk and sacrifice for yeah. what you truly believe in? Are you willing to stand up and say, I'm gonna give it my all? Literally okay. give it my all. All of your it. heart yeah. and soul because you firmly believe in something. You know that it's your calling. You know that it's even your God-driven purpose. You know that the higher calling you know. is calling you. Yeah. When we That's had it. children, and I would say my kid, they're all my babies now, we mm -hmm. would go in for, say, an IBM uh, event, and I would have teachers pull my husband to the side and say, you know, that kid wouldn't even talk in my class, doesn't do his work, and he's leading your workshop. Yeah. That was the strength. <laughs> That, impact that was and influence. the thing. Yeah. Impact and influence and changing people's lives because you know what's so fascinating? Uh, and it's so ironic, too, that you just, you just said this, too, is in the time that we live in right now in this COVID world of how much everything has, re has changed and how I right. think the future of everything will change because it'll never be the same. The yeah. workplace will never be the same. The way people look at the world will never be the same. The way people perceive things will never be the same. And Correct. so when you said that someone pulled you aside and said, you know what? My kid is doing better because of what you did. You know that you're creating impact, like actual right. tangible life changing impact that Correct. is going to change the life of that child because children are the future. I don't care how you look at it. Children Period. are the yeah. future. And they're all capable. They're not bad. They're capable. Right? And, and, and it's our job, leadership, parents, government, whoever, community, faith-based, it's our job to figure okay. out how this kid learns. Yep. Period. And you need support to do that. Yeah. If there is no there is no magic wand of how you're gonna uh, get to this kid. And and so, like you said, in this virtual world. Yeah. It's, it's even, I won't use the word chaotic, but it's even more challenging because where we were just last year, I could touch them. I could say to a kid, now when I come back in here next month, I don't want to see you in the office. I want to see better grades or whatever it is. I had tangible and however we communicated, whether it's through Slack or whatever our platform was, it's it was still, they knew I was coming and they knew they had to pull it together yeah. <laughs> before so that, I, I got there. <laughs> that, that's commitment though, Kenya. Yeah. That, that is commitment because you're absolutely right. I mean, this virtual world that we live in, because I mean, right now, I mean, we're interviewing via Zoom, you know, doing this right. in audio and video. And I think that's really becoming the norm. And I think uh, from an e-learning standpoint, too, or just really learning in school specifically and, and just kids, the way they... They, they absorb information is going to be do, done in a much more virtual setting, uh, which, you know, you said the word pivot and, mm -hmm. and actually you're, uh, I didn't know you were in the Chicago area. I actually have a client out in the Chicago area. So next time I come, I come up there, we'll have to get together and, and talk. Oh, you, like, you have an open, yeah. Open door, please. <laughs> um, but where I was going with this is when you said pivot, you know, so this was like April, a April or May, you know, this year, like when really COVID really started accelerating and yeah. you, know, you, live, you live in, in the Chicago area. So you know how like tense everything is. In fact, the vast majority of the COVID cases reported has have been in the Chicago vicinity and Chicago downtown, right? Correct. And so pivoting is really only your option is the only option that you have is you know, whether it's reinvent yourself or shift focus, because you have two choices, because we've seen this from a business standpoint, especially in this COVID era, a lot of small businesses went from 100 to zero overnight. They Correct. lost all their revenue because they were serving an industry or a vertical that now is becoming obsolete because of this COVID world. 
And so your option was, you know, for example, with a client of mine who was in the sports and live entertainment. Well, there's no sports anymore. No. There's no live entertainment anymore. Fans are no. not going to stadiums. So no. pivot because you realize that, and the pivoting is both, I think, as they say, a curse and a blessing. Yes. A curse. Like good looks. <laughs> That, that's a good way to put it is that it's a curse <laughs> and a blessing because yeah. it's a catch-22 situation. But at the same time, from an entrepreneurial and business standpoint, it forces you to think more strategically. And guess what? If you've looked at any successful company, and I just read that Apple, I think, is the first $2 trillion company in the world. Yeah, it just did a split. It did a split because mm -hmm. it's so big. But it's actually very simple. And the reason I'm talking about this, Steve Jobs was the first person in the world to create the emotional connection be between technology exactly. and human beings. Exactly. And, he's and that's why friend. Apple to this day is the leading forefront. So many people, whether in the technology space or not, are comparing themselves to Apple because of, of the level of the reputation yes. and how they've pivoted themselves because they're constantly pivoting. Absolutely. And he left it in the best hands with Tim Cook because so. he's even more personable, right? I mean, Steve Jobs, yeah. you know, spared the rod, right? But then yeah. you have this Tim Cook effect, yeah. which brings more of that social emotional impact uh, to Apple where they're, even though it's very techy, beautiful scenery, but yeah. when you walk into an Apple store, it's hi, it's welcome. It's, you know, you're, you're not overwhelmed in your purchase. And yeah. it's, it's, it's an amazing, seamless experience how he's continued, even how he's branched over. And I say he, I, sp I know he speaks for all of Apple, how yeah. he's branched over into the education side. He's been one of our biggest supporters, how we have curated our company and a uh, biggest supporter along with the pivot as well. And that's why the 21st education, it's so apropos right now because that was a part of my thesis that I, when we started, I said we have about a five year run to get kids yeah. at grade level, some type of technology because the jobs of tomorrow will all have a technology component to it. And if our yeah. kids are not ready, grade school, high school is too late, and college is too late because in other countries, they're already farming those kids. Those kids are already ready. That's why they come to our Big Ten and our tier universities because yep. they have, they've already been giving those tools in grade school, primary school, yep. secondary school. Yep. So yep. that's really the whole entire compass of what Jones Software does. We're not just a one way stop for school districts. We make sure that the goal is that. Our kids are computer savvy, computer science driven. They have some type of component uh, in that education. And then we career. I mean, it, you know, it has to lead to a job. They have to be hireable in what is now our new normal. We're, we probably won't go back to in-class learning. Maybe some hybrid, yeah. but it won't be the 1800, you know, desk in front of, it won't, that's, it's gone now. And I, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I felt this way. Um, because again, I, I came from technology. My, you know, my grandparents, they, they've been in this game since the 60s. So they yeah. I was always seeing technology evolving as I was growing up. And that was kind of always their thing. Like you've got to, you know, You've got to know technology. You got to hang. My grandma would say, "You got to hang in there with IBM, right?" <laughs> no, that's true. And, and yeah. actually, I want to spend the next few minutes talking about education going into the 21st century. But before getting your more of an elaborate take from you, I wanted to share a few things when you were talking about educational advancement, because yeah. as an Eastern European, I remember it was probably third grade. You know, this was like on the borderline before we immigrated to the United States. Right. Um, uh, the level of math, for example, that, that I was being taught back home. And exactly. then when we immigrated to uh, the United States, obviously you go sort of through this uh, pre-qualification, right? Mm -hmm. I was uh, 13 years old. It was right before my 14th uh, birthday. So they, they, they really wasn't sure what class to put me in. It was a seventh mm -hmm. grade, eighth grade. Well, I graduated seventh grade in a week. 
See? Because when I was, when we moved here, even though I had a language barrier, which mind you, in three months, I had to learn how to develop basic conversations in English. It was the biggest clusterfuck I think that I've ever gone through, but it was exactly. also the most enlightening thing that I think I've ever done, one of many. But the reason I'm speaking to this is I remember vividly, like, I felt lost because I thought that I was out of place. But in fact, you were from ahead an of education, the game. I was ahead of the game. <laughs> but I didn't know that then because, and in fact, I remember my friends, you know, from like seventh grade during that week, you know, like people that I was talking to and they're, I even have a very, very old school friend that to this day was still talking now through social because he moved from the St. Louis mm -hmm. area, but he was all the way back to like seventh grade. He's the only person that I've remained in contact with like since 14 years old for 26 yeah. years, basically. And so, but I remember back then, like the math that I had learned, like they were surprised that I, I could do the math, even though I had a language barrier. And then when I got into eighth grade, even like in the first two weeks, like I was showing signs of participation, raising my hand, because it's how I was taught, mind you, in third grade, fourth grade, back in exactly. under a former communist regime. But like at the time, I thought that there's something wrong with me. And like I, I have a learning deficiency. <laughs> That's what was going through my head at 13, 14 years old. I'm like, and my, even though my parents, mind you, my, my parents don't have a former education. I mean, fast forward, my dad is an entrepreneur and runs a successful business now, you mm -hmm. know, coming up on a million per year. But that wasn't the case back then, you know. So, like, when you were talking about this, it's so interesting because uh, the educational system in the United States, you know, I think to this day is in part being operated the way it was in the 1800s. You know, like the in-class seating, you got to sit. And look, I mean, I'm someone who dropped out of college because I thought it was boring as fuck and what yeah. I was being taught. And I learned a lot more with hands-on. And I keep going to this Jim Rohn quote, by the way, the formal education will help you build a career. Real life education will help you build an empire. Exactly. And so for, for this country, we sit 25 on the world stage in education right now. It may be a little lord. Don't quote me. Completely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the concern was my ancestors, who are native to this land, um, were still a part of the Jim Crow South, as they as they call it. And so, mm -hmm. through history, uh, we had to write bills: Civil Rights Bill, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, right. Voting Rights Act, right. So all of these things were a part of. Uh, my uh, forefathers, uh, we just, God bless them, just lost a dear uncle of mine, Congressman Lewis. Mm -hmm. So they fought for the rights that we, equal rights that we should have. Well, kind of didn't go so equal. I mean, it just, yeah. it is what it is, as that's the word's been going, that's the quotes has been mm -hmm. said uh, now. But what did happen through the uh, administration before this one that we're in, they reenacted what they call ESSA. And so that law ensures, and, and anything you do in this country, it, the law has to back you. Uh, it, if the law is not backing you, it's not happening here. So just to give you my, 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 uh, <laughs> my, my kid is full. So with ESSA, it says every student should succeed act. It's, it's, it's very blatant. It's very, um, firm in what it means and how the bill was passed and how it's uh, passed down to each school district. So it's now an open season for school districts that I mentioned earlier in our conversation to start getting the funding to bridge these technology. And, and, and now it's a conversation about closing these gaps. But guess what? The beauty is it's not just closing the gap here in the States. I'm having the same conversations in the UK for high quality and equity and equality, yeah. career development, we're all finally on the same page. And you either thank the pandemic or the, the gods or the universe, but at least we're all able to sit at the table and have the same conversation of what we want our kids to look like in the 21st century. Yeah. Because your experience, my experience in math, I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I have a, I'm a scientist, right? So I should have a lot of math, a lot of chemistry, 
but I couldn't go past statistics. Uh, once I hit elementary statistics in college, that was kind of enough for me. But here on the other side, when you mentioned your quote, I write algorithms, <laughs> right? So <laughs> fascinating. Like, <laughs> That's fascinating. It really yeah. is. And, and, it's, and it's amazing to me because I'm writing algorithms from a passion because I'm in the classroom with our kids and I see how their learning deficiencies are creeping up. I see little boy, little Ivans, I'm going to call them now, right? I'm going to write that in one of my programs. So you'll have a Aww. name on the program. <laughs> but I see that. little Ivans that come to this country with language barriers, and we found ways to help with that. So if, you, if, you, if you're if you speaking only Spanish or you're speaking only, you know, Eastern European, there will, it will, it will, our program will go to any language now, and, and it's a click of a button. I mean, it, and it'll speak it out. So okay. we have tried to find AI technology with Microsoft, and we've done mm -hmm. everything we know how to do to work on the kid who is like you thought you were behind but wasn't. Right. Or the kid that really is behind, and there's, a, there's some learning disability. I mean, we – have not left anything off the table. We are working tirelessly now, and I'm, I apologize last week, I had to change our plans, but we're now looking at a go live feature in the platform so that Zoom or, you know, that's not an option. It, it'll all be inclusive um, for slides and uh, yep. you know, sharing content. And, uh, and what I'm really proud of is how we calculate and really pinpoint where a kid is deficient because it it may not be yeah. where the teacher yeah. thinks it is so it's it's <coughs> really a tool that we say all inclusive because we are going to go virtual we're going to we're going to start our field trips again we're going to start those yeah. outside coding classes um but math is to me it's the entryway we we just like you said you had a language barrier but you knew two plus two you knew what that was even with yep. you know so in any war anywhere in the world anywhere in the country anywhere on the planet two plus two is the same everywhere and yep. if our kids are not prepared because of the new normal right that that universal language and uh because of our new normal we we will we'll, they'll be lost yeah. And, and that's that's why the ramp up now, the working harder, the spending more hours, um, we've kind of flushed out our old team and we're flushing in a new team because at this point, I don't care if you're from India, China. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you had, like, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've enacted my Steve Jobs attitude. Like, this is what I want. <laughs> exactly. well, two things I wanted to yeah. mention because it's really important to highlight about what you said is, as you were talking about, you know, going through your degree and, and I think it was statistics that you mentioned is, is uh, and then you were talking about the, the, the um, uh, more traditional in-class environment is that what most people don't understand that whether you're a four-year-old or you are a 40-year-old is just that you're going to learn more and more effectively in an environment that you're comfortable in. Exactly. You know, to where you, you feel that like you're comfortable, whether you're sitting in a chair or, or you're, you're, you're just a little bit more relaxed. Exactly. And a couple of things on that is I think with the work environment, with this COVID world, there's a lot of companies are not fathoming that, even mm -hmm. though it's moving more to a standard. I think it's going gonna, gonna to become the standard because companies are going to realize that whether it's on the educational space or, you know, uh, uh, marketing space or whatever, mm -hmm. that you can you can actually be more productive and efficient in an environment that you are comfortable in because exactly. if you're not you're not going to operate you know and then or you're not going to perform i should i should say at your peak now exactly. the other thing you mentioned is writing algorithms which this is really important is algorithms are about logic Literally, yeah. it's all it's all about logic. And exactly. I keep thinking to another quote, it's by Tony Robbins that, you know, guy that runs a six billion dollar empire now, along with a couple other dudes, that uh, business is 90 percent logic, 10 percent execution. But exactly. having the right logic and this and, and if you if you if you don't even believe in this quote or the logic is 90 percent of business and 10 percent is execution is look at what Google has done. And how they've captured the search market 
basically they hold 97% of the search market because the other 3% is Bing. It's because they're focused on algo. And again, the reason I bring up uh, Google is because yeah. it's an immigrant owned company, one of the yeah. largest in the world that was started in a garage. Yes, in the old Silicon Valley, like exactly. no, in the misfit world, like it was. In the misfit world, exactly. <laughs> yeah. so that's, yeah. that's, that's amazing, you know, yeah. like, and, and I know, again, this conversation, we can carry on with this conversation probably endlessly, but, you know, I want to I say thank you, sharing so much about the educational space, you know, yeah. your experience with the Bolshoi Theater. And before we, we sign things off on this episode, Throw out some social handle websites. How can people connect with you? Oh, yes. We're Jones Software Corporation. We're in Chicago, Illinois. We're at the beautiful Merchandise Mart. Our website is www.j-soft.com. And our Twitter handle, I'm Kenya Global, or you can reach us at JSOF. Uh, our Instagram is Jones Software Corporation, or my personal is Kenya Global. You can always Google Kenya Global, and it comes up a lot because I've branded that for years. And okay. Twitter, I think I mentioned that. Facebook, Jones Software Corporation. Yeah, reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to, we work with large-scale school districts. We work with, we try to work with parents. Um, we we show up at PTA meetings. That's how involved we are. Uh, if there is an issue, uh, and we do lobbying, we work on policy. We, we're in with our governments. Doesn't matter which administration. Law is law. So we are happy to get in the trenches with you. We we're happy to launch our new tiers program with Microsoft. So we'll be teachers this year, teaching computer science, and that's one we've been working on for a long, long time. And the fact that Microsoft gave us the blessing. So we we're kissing the yeah. ring now and hopefully we'll have a great uh, school year out in North Dakota. So shout out to uh, Central Cass High School. <laughs> awesome. Kenya, it, it has been an absolute pleasure. You know, I want to thank you for jamming with me on this episode. I truly do. Oh, thank you, Ivan. And anytime you're in Chicago, come by and make you some really good uh, Bulgarian tea. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,